Skip you back. Up here. Again, you know, get back into the Word of God, the book of Galatians. We started the book of Galatians a few weeks ago. It's a great book written by the Apostle Paul to his uh, converts there in uh, Galatia. And uh, so far, Paul's kind of talked about how they've drifted away from uh, grace and how they've kind of drifted away from the, the true gospel, and they've started to drift off into some uh, false gospels or heretical teachings. And he wants to know why. You know, why are you drifting into these uh, heretical teachings? Are they trying to please people? Or are they trying to please Christ? And that's the question of the day that we're going to address in our short little passage here today of uh, Galatians 1.10. we got one little lonely verse. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there to Galatians 1, verse 10. And it says, Still hear pages flipping. I'm not waiting for you anymore, right Mike. Well, it's, a, it's a new book. <laughs> what? I can't get the pages. They're stuck together? Yeah, no. Is it printed by Holman? Holman Bibles are notorious for having pages that stick together. Excuses, excuses. Here we go. Galatians 1.10. For am I now trying to persuade people or God or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time we could gather here once again in your house uh, this morning to worship you in song and spirit and to learn from your uh, ever important word and how important it is to just stay the course and uh, finish strong. We want to lift up all the folks on our prayer request list this morning and folks that have lost loved ones and have surgeries coming up and uh, everything else under the sun. We pray that you be with them and their families. And I pray you send your Holy Spirit upon us this morning to soften up our hearts so that we can learn to be a servant of Christ. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, people pleasers or servants of Christ, right? Wait, wait, which are we? That's our question of the day. Or, you know, maybe we should start off by asking, you know, what's the difference? What's the difference between a, a people pleaser and, and a, you know, a Christ pleaser, a servant of Christ? Well, here's some examples. Uh, people pleasers, they have this overwhelming desire to please other people, but servants of Christ have, you know, an all-consuming passion to please God. Uh, people pleasers are motivated by the fear of man. Servants of Christ are inspired by the fear of God. Uh, people pleasers pretend to serve God when in reality they just kind of intend to serve themselves. But servants of Christ actually intend to serve God by meeting the needs of other people. People pleasers are anxious for approval from others and distraught when they don't get it. Servants of Christ simply love others and leave approval or disapproval to the judgment of God. So which one are we? Okay, which one am I? Which one are you? People pleasers or servants of Christ? That is the question the Apostle Paul uh, confronts the Galatians with at uh, the end of uh, this chapter in the opening chapter of the letter. And why does he ask this question? Okay? Well, it's because Paul knows that the crisis in Galatia is not simply a theological crisis, but it's also a moral one. And, you know, the Galatians aren't just simply confused. They're, they're being people pleasers rather than servants of Christ. 
So that explains, at least in part, by their, you know, leaving Paul's true gospel that we talked about last week, okay, for a fake one. But Paul also knows that the Judaizers are people pleasers as well. And, you know, sure, they've made a good biblical case for the Galatians to get, you know, circumcised, which was a big deal to them, uh, which, you know, we'll get into later in the book as we go along. But it's only so they can, as Paul says, make a good showing in the flesh and just kind of avoid displeasing those who have uh, power over them. So is it any wonder then that Paul injects the theme of people pleasing into the letter at this point? Now, if I were writing a letter to the evangelical Christian uh, church in America in the year 2021, I'd spend a lot more than one verse uh, on this. I'd spend an entire chapter uh, on this subject. And it seems we have a lot of fake gospel and false teaching out there being conducted by churches that are just, you know, kind of trying to tell people what they want to hear or churches or, or, you know, Bible teachers just trying to be, you know, kind of hip and popular with the, you know, Hollywood crowd or just be kind of hip and popular with, you know, corporate America that's gone, you know, woke. Mike found out this week from the Coca-Cola company that he's too white. I've been telling him that for years. But that's why he didn't get elected as mayor of all time. Amen. Amen. But what happens when you do that, and you just go along with every little trend that comes along, is... Yeah, worldly trend, you start to wander, wander away from biblical truth. So likewise, Paul must confront people pleasing head on because he knows it's a big part of the crisis that's going on here in Galatia. And he wants to say to the Galatians, and what I believe God wants to say to each of us as, you know, evangelical Christians living in 21st century America is simply this. People pleasers do not make good servants of Christ. Okay, at least people pleasing in, a, in the bad way. And that's what we're going to talk about. And there are several reasons for that. And I'll give you a few today. Uh, starting with my first point this morning, number one, if you're taking notes, is uh, people pleasers cave under pressure. They cave under pressure. Or you could say they can't stand the heat, so they get out of the kitchen. Does anybody use that expression anymore? Can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Kitchens used to be even hotter. But they especially cave under pressure from, you know, in influential people. And it's the influential people in our lives, you know, not the insignificant, who tempt us to people, please. Okay, no one plays the people pleaser with someone that's unimportant to them. Okay, like the, the homecoming queen uh, over at the high school doesn't play the people pleaser with, you know, some, you know, freshman boy. Right? But the freshman boy might try to get some favor with, you know, the, the seniors or something. You know, just like us. We're not likely to people please with, with, with it. Uh, you know, the person who checks us out at Walmart or, you know, the girl running the drive through window at Burger King. I mean, how much time do we try spend trying to impress them? But we might be tempted to people please around our boss or, you know, around our relatives or, you know, your spouse or maybe not your spouse, but, uh, or, you know, like the president, if he came to town. Remember when Obama was president and we all complained about him for eight years? But I bet you if he showed up and walked through this door right here, I bet your attitude would change in a hurry. Yeah, it would. Mike would be the first one to shake his hand and be like, I'm so glad to meet you. I've been trying to not be so white lately, <laughs> as Coke said. But it'd be hard, you know, not to, you know, be hello, you know, be nice. It would. You know, it would. Or whoever. But Paul certainly understood the pressure of influential people and how they tempt us 
to compromise our gospel-rooted uh, principles. In fact, in chapter 2, he describes a time when it would have been very easy for him to cheat on his convictions in order to win uh, the approval of you know, people who were influential around him. And you see what happened is he had to make a trip to Jerusalem to meet with the leaders of the early church. And while he was there, there were some folks who gave him uh, tremendous pressure to have his colleague Titus uh, circumcised. And in situations like this, you know, people pleasers, you know, they kind of give in. And they cave under that, that pressure. And they'd rather compromise their biblical convictions than have the influential people in their lives uh, look at them with disapproval. And, you know, maybe you've found yourself in a similar situation uh, recently. Maybe, you know, even this week. You know, maybe at work or at home or talking with a friend or, you know, whoever. People pleasers yield the pressure, but servants of Christ, like Paul, they stand their ground. And to those, you know, wielding great pressure to uh, compromise, Paul says later on in verse 2-5, but we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. You see, it's not just about you. You've got to preserve the gospel for the next uh, generation. And every, you know, generation seems like it's got to go back and, you know, fix some things where the previous one drifted. So that was no doubt. That was a costly move for Paul there. So I'm sure he earned the disapproval of those who thought to be influential in Jerusalem. But he knew his compromise at, you know, this point would have been even more costly for the Galatians because it would have meant a compromise of the truth of the gospel, uh, which would have meant serving himself and not them with his actions. So that's the first reason, okay? They, they like to cave under pressure. Then the second reason uh, people pleasers don't make good servants of Christ is because people pleasers ignore hypocrisy, especially harmful hypocrisy. And within a Christian community, you know, there are few things that are as, you know, corrosive and toxic as hypocrisy, and we're all hypocrites. It's just to what degree is really the question. And, you know, when a Christian has a habit of saying one thing and doing another, they can do all sorts of damage to the, the church. Uh, but sometimes it's easy for us to ignore because we just kind of, you know, don't really want to upset the, the apple cart. And I imagine the Apostle Paul was at least tempted to ignore the harmful hypocrisy he saw developing uh, in the church uh, over at Antioch, and as we learn from Galatians 2, 11 to 14, uh, when the apostle Peter visited, he and the other Jews, you know, freely ate with the Gentiles. That is, until a few important individuals from Jerusalem came to town, proclaiming a different set of convictions, at which point, you know, Peter pulled back. Right? Well, I better not eat with these people. 2, 12 says... For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Yet notice how Peter's one act of hypocrisy spread like, you know, gangrene and it uh, just infected the whole church. Verse 13 there in chapter 2 says, Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Oh, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, he even was led astray. And every last one of them was led astray by Peter's, you know, one act of hypocrisy. 
And that's harmful hypocrisy, that the, the kind that undermines uh, a whole church. You know, every last one of them was led astray, except the converted Pharisee from the city of Tarsus, right? Every one of them, but, but Paul. And he didn't ignore or overlook anyone's, his, anyone's hypocrisy, not even Peter's. Instead, he called Peter out on it, which I'm sure was hard to do. And Paul confronted Peter's uh, harmful hypocrisy, and he did so publicly because of the public nature and consequences of Peter's actions. And verse 14 there goes on to say, But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas, that's Peter, in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? You know, I can imagine, though, it would have been tempting for Paul to look the other way there, right? It's not a big deal. How long does lunch last? You know, or, yeah, maybe I'll just let it slide this time. Well, maybe say something if it happens again. <coughs> Or how convenient for him to have just, you know, called it, you know, it's just a little indiscretion or, you know, it's just kind of a difference of opinion. You know, it's not that big of a deal. How easy it would have been for Paul not to stick his neck out or run the risk of, you know, alienating himself from the entire church. Yet how much of a people pleaser he would have been and not a servant of Christ if he had just kind of you know, turned a blind eye to Peter's hypocrisy, okay? Who knows where Christianity would be today, okay? As Gentiles, we should uh, appreciate what he did there because we would have certainly been in outcasts uh, back in that day. So people pleasers, they cave under pressure, they ignore hypocrisy, and then here's a... Uh, third one, which kind of goes a little bit with number one. It might be the most popular, uh, at least in our day of time. But number three is people pleasers, you know, just like to avoid embarrassment. They like to avoid just the embarrassment, the shame of the cross. You know, maybe that's what it is more specifically. It's because people pleasers hide from the shame of the cross. Okay, no one likes to be embarrassed, least of all people pleasers, and, and you know, it's kind of death to a people pleaser to be publicly exposed or, you know, humiliated or called out. Okay, but to be a servant of Christ, you have to be willing to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Okay, you have to remember the cross was not just a method of execution. It was a tool of humiliation <laughs> as well. And uh, we'll get into this even a little more tonight uh, at 530. But in the ancient world, you know, death on a cross was the most shameful of deaths. Okay, crucifixion was extremely painful, extremely gruesome, but it was also very public and therefore very embarrassing and very humiliating. Okay, a man was beaten, stripped naked, and then nailed by his hands and feet to a piece of wood, which was made to stand up in plain daylight so that every passerby could mock and ridicule as he helplessly and, you know, hopelessly just hung there and choked to death. Okay, that's the way Jesus of Nazareth died. He was publicly executed and in the most embarrassing and humiliating fashion imaginable. It's like Hebrews 12, 2 says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So shameful it was, and shameful it is, and, you know, shameful it continues to be in the lives of people who do uh, take it up. And no one understood the shame of bearing the cross better than 
uh, old Paul there, no one suffered more for serving Christ or was more shamefully treated than Paul. He got it from all directions. As Christ's servant, Paul insisted upon a circumcision-free gospel for the Gentiles. And that, you know, infuriated some of his Jewish colleagues who took out their frustration on Paul. So he suffered for it. He suffered for it often. He suffered for it intensely. Others, however, tried to sever the relationship between the cross of Christ and being a servant of Christ. And in fact, they were the ones stirring up trouble uh, in the churches there in Galatia. And of course, Paul understands how this works, and he knows he too could make his life a, a you know, just a whole lot easier if he would fudge just a little bit on the cross of Christ. And he knows his persecution would go away pretty quick if he would just quietly remove the offense of the cross. And notice what he says later on in Galatians 5.11. He says there, Now, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. You know, but as a servant of Christ, he is just not going to do it. Indeed, he can't do it. In fact, just the opposite. Right? He's not going to run from the shame of the cross, but he's going to boast in it. He says in 6.14, But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross, and I to the world. So Paul had to learn the hard way that a servant of Christ cannot avoid the humiliation of and can't run from the shame of the cross. And you know what the, the you know the, the root of the problem with people pleasers is. Okay, the root of the problem is that people pleasers are kind of really uh, idolaters. People pleasers make idols of other people. And thus they crave their approval as though it were the bread of life. It's like getting likes on Facebook. For some people, that's the new bread of life. And we're all guilty of it from some degree or another. You know, nobody likes to be uh, unpopular. There's a people pleaser in all of us. And, uh, you know, one that needs continual crucifixion if we're going to become the servants of Christ that God wants us to be. But, you know, how do we fight and, you know, kill that people pleaser in our own hearts? Well, the same way we fight against any remaining sin in our life, and it's by fighting the fight of faith and by trusting uh, what the word says. So if we're going to gain victory in our battle against people pleasing, we have to embrace the fact, first of all, that Jesus Christ has taken all the judgments against us and nailed them to his cross. And that's where they are going to remain forever. Can okay, every judgment that ever stood against us or that ever could stand against us, every harsh or humiliating word uttered by friend or foe, is nailed to the tree. And then secondly, if we're going to fight the temptation to people, please, we also must come uh, to really believe that God's judgment is the only one that counts. Okay, in the end, the only opinion that's going to matter is God's opinion, God's judgment. So we cannot entrust ourselves to the judgment of others, but to the judgment of God. Okay? You may not have done this, but, you know, people are temperamental. Did you know that? Uh, they have their own agendas. Okay? They're full of opinions. Sometimes with opinions that change from one day to the next. Right? 
30, 40 years ago, Speedy Gonzalez was hilarious. Now he's racist. See how it all changes just from one day to the next? And so do their judgments. So if we're working hard to curry favor from other people and do what they think we should do, we will eventually work ourselves into a state of exhaustion and despair. All right, you ever have that person that, or people that, you know, they're just really hard to please and you can't really ever please them and it's just exhausting, you know? Just trying to win them over all the time, day after day after day after day. Well, remember, God's judgment also is far kinder than man's. God's judgment is also far simpler than man's. It doesn't involve a thousand different and competing expectations from us from everywhere around. Okay, and at the end of the day, God's judgment is the only one that's going to count. So, to wrap it up here this morning so we can move on to the Lord's Supper, you know, people pleasers do not make good servants of Christ because people pleasers, remember that, cave under pressure. Uh, they ignore harmful hypocrisy and then they, you know, run from the shame of the cross. They like to avoid uh, embarrassment. Don't want to be embarrassed. But more than that, you know, people pleasers, you know, they, they live anxious lives. There's a lot of anxiety in it, you know, always worrying about whether they're going to get, you know, approval or disapproval from others. Okay, and in so doing, they miss the approval that can only come from God himself. Okay, being a servant of Christ is far sweeter than being a slave to man's opinions. And the reward of being a servant of Christ is far, far superior to any reward we can obtain from any man. It certainly lasts longer. Eternity is a long time. For only by serving Christ Jesus are we going to hear on that final day the approval that our hearts so desperately long to hear. <coughs> well done, good and faithful servant. And that'll be the day where God pushes the smiley face emoji on your Facebook page and gives you a like says, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's all that'll last. And let's pray and uh, have our invitation. And then after that, I'll have my uh, two ushers come forward, uh, Dean and White Mike. And uh, go from there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. Uh, for this time we gather here this morning in your house and learn what it means to be a servant of Christ and there's just a lot of pressure in this world around us to just kind of cave in to uh, the world and the world's opinions and it's getting harder and harder to just trudge on and hold the line of uh, what it means to be a Christian and I just pray that that be on our hearts and minds uh, this week. Uh, Passion Week, or uh, as we head into Resurrection Sunday, and uh, we also just want to take one more opportunity to lift up all the folks on our uh, prayer request list this morning, that you be with them and their families, pray that you just watch over us, put a hedge of protection around us, and this church, and in Jesus' name, I pray and give thanks, amen.